Well, so last fall, my wife and I, we met up with some friends. We went out west, and we went hiking up into the Rocky Mountains. How many of you ever been out in the Rocky Mountains? How many of you have ever been hiking? All right, like hiking. All right, so, you know, we're out there hiking up this mountain path, and as we're, we're on the path, you know, we, we got this place we're trying to get to way up in the mountains, and, you know, anytime you're out in the mountains, you're going to come across some valleys and some gaps, right? And so as we're hiking along the path, waiting, you know, just looking forward to getting up to this high place, you know, just to check out, just see all the scenic, pic, you know, it's just amazing, just getting way up in the mountains. And as you're hiking up the path, then all of a sudden you come across a, a gap where there's a stream coming down right? Now, now, when you're looking at it, the water's up a little bit, and, you know, the, the rocks are kind of covered with water, and there's no real easy way to get across, and you don't want to get your hiking boots wet or take them off, right? Because then you got to figure out how you're going to get them dry. So when you come to that place to cross over this little stream, what do you do? You jump, all right? What if you can't jump all the way across it? John's going to jump, all right? Let's be creative here. So what, so what do you typically do when you get to that place? You, you, you make a bridge. All right. You get an A today. You make a bridge. All right. You grab some rocks. You look around. You grab some tree limbs, some logs, right? And you make a way to get across to the other side. And typically when you're hiking, you know, some of us go by ourselves, right? But typically you're not by yourself. And when you get to the other side... What do you typically do? You typically turn around to help the other person get across, right? And Linda's like, no way, man. They can just fall in. (laughs) We're going to stop and pray for her right now. (laughs) Right? You typically help someone else get across. That's what we'll be talking about today because today we're starting a new series called just Bridges. And we're going to be looking at building bridges. And today our topic is Bridge Building. And what I want you to grasp as we're starting this series today is that most of you, if not every one of you, have the creative ability because you've done it before when you've been hiking, even maybe as a kid or as an adult, to build a bridge to get across something to the other side, right? How many of you have ever built some kind of a bridge to get to the other side, right? So, so most of you raise your hand. So you all have the skill set to build bridges. And that's what we're we'll going to be talking about, being a bridge builder, because that's an important thing. And the reality is, is that there are people all around us that need help getting to the other side. We're all on this journey, this faith journey. We were created as eternal beings, and we're on this faith journey. And for probably most of us, if not all of us here in this room, and those that are joining us online, at some point in time, somebody helped us come to a place where we crossed over to the other side. We made a decision to give our life And give faith, profess faith in Christ. Because Christ made a bridge for us to get to him. And so we have this responsibility to help others get to the same place. And I want to start off with a verse here in Isaiah 59. Because it's much different to being hiking and you're going on this path. And we want to get to the top of the mountain. There's this vista. There's a certain place you want to get to. right? It's very different when it comes to the reality of life itself and eternity. And the scripture tells us here in Isaiah 59, Isaiah is pleading with God's people, right? They've just been kind of drifting off, off the path. And it says, surely the arm of the Lord is not too short to save, nor his ear too dull to hear. So it's saying that, that God, he came to rescue us. God longs to rescue us. God longs for us to, to be with him on his side. Right? And so he says, his arm isn't too short. God's done everything in his power. That's why he sent his son, Jesus. We just worshiped, you know, last, this, not too long ago went for Easter. Right? Jesus poured out his life on the cross for us. And he rose from the grave, conquering sin and death for us. And so the scripture says, the arm of the Lord is not too short to save, nor is the ear too dull to hear. But then it goes on in the second verse in Isaiah 59. It says, however, there's, a, there's an issue. There's an issue in the path. There's a roadblock in the path from getting to the other side. And it says, you are iniquities. All right, this is another word for sin, that we're caught. We're trapped in this life of sin. Our iniquities have separated you from God. So there's this this major gap in the path 
to eternity. Your, your iniquities have separated you from your God. Your sins have hidden his face from you so that he will not hear. Now the verse before that says, God's ear is not too dull that he doesn't hear. However, there's a challenge that, that many people are on this path. And they're, and they're trying to get to the top of the mountain, but they don't know how to get there. And then they come to a place where there is a complete gap. They're separated from God. And sometimes they don't even realize that they're separated from God. And there's a huge gap. And their eternity is at stake. And so God has for us, he's given us just an incredible responsibility in this to be bridge builders. And so I'm going to give us kind of a working definition of what this means to be a a bridge builder. This is from a dictionary online. I just kind of like the way this, this kind of words it to kind of help us grab this concept. But a bridge builder is a person who attempts to connect or reconcile opposing parties Right? So how many of you ever been, you know, know somebody that's gotten to an argument with a loved one or a friend and they stopped talking to them? Right? And then you felt like, oh, I gotta be the adult here, right? And step in, right? And in those moments, we are being a bridge builder, helping them be reconciled with the other person. Like, come on, guys, this, you know, you guys are better than this. Stop fighting. Stop being separated from each other. But a bridge builder is a person who attempts to connect or reconcile opposing parties. And the scripture tells us that in this situation of being in sin, that we are enemies to God. We're separated from him. And so God has given us this incredible responsibility to be a bridge builder, to help people connect with God, to help bring them to a place where they can put their faith in God. Christ. And so I want to look at another passage of scripture, and then we're going to jump into the gospel of John here this morning. Um, I'm going to start off in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 here. And in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, the apostle Paul is writing to this church. And in this section of his letter, he's wanting them to understand, these believers to understand who they are, what God has done for them in Christ. That Christ made a bridge for us to have to have faith, put our faith in him so that we can be with him for all eternity. And so he says here in 2 Corinthians 5, 17, therefore, he says, if anyone is in Christ, that means if we, anybody is in relationship with Christ, they profess faith in Christ, they've committed their life to him. That's a phrase that Paul often uses, being in Christ, in relationship, connected with Christ. The new creation has come, that God has done something new in us. In our sinful state, our spirit is separated from God. When we put our faith in Christ, he renews our spirit. We become a new creation, a new person. He says the old is gone, referring to the old life is gone. But it says the new is here. So he's saying, look, this is what God has done for you. He's made a way for you to get to the other side. He, be, he was the bridge that separated us. We were separated from God because of sin, but Jesus poured out his life on the cross. The cross was the bridge, and we put our faith in him. He brings us to God. We're made right with God. He said, this is what God has done for us through Christ. He's given us the ability to cross, and now we're a new creation. But then he goes on. He said, but this doesn't stop here. He goes on. He says, you guys are bridge builders. He says, all this is from God. This is what he's done. And he says that he, all this is from God who reconciled us to himself. Through Christ, he was a bridge builder and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. This is the responsibility of Christ followers. This is the responsibility given to the church. Says he's given us this ministry. Everyone that professes faith in Christ has been given this ministry to be a bridge builder. And then he explains what this ministry is of reconciliation. It goes on in verse 19. It says, And that God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting people's sins against them. That's the whole reason of Good Friday, the focus on Jesus becoming the full penalty of our sin, being a sin offering for us. He took the wrath against sin upon himself on the cross so that we don't have to go through that, right? When we put our faith in him, he became the sin offering for us. And then he rose from the grave. So that's what he's explaining here, that God, he built a bridge through Christ. He's reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting people's sins against them, against them, those that have put their faith in Christ to become a new creation. And he goes on and he repeats it and he's committed to us the message of reconciliation. I've shared with you guys before, anytime we see repetition in scripture, this is kind of a Jewish way of writing. And repetition is emphasis. Paul says, guys, I want you to get this. I want you to understand this. 
This is, he has called us to be bridge builders because of what he has done for us. And he's committed to us this message of reconciliation. He goes on in verse 20. He says, we are therefore, we have this incredible job. We are Christ's ambassadors. We are representatives of the kingdom of God on this earth, ambassadors in the earth for Christ. He says, as though God were making his appeal through us, and he says, for those that are in the church that are not reconciled with God, he says, we implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled with God. Paul is trying to help bring them across, those that have not made their life right with Christ. But he said, but those that have, that are new creations, he has entrusted the, to us this responsibility, this job of being bridge builders and having this ministry of reconciliation. And that's the whole reason that Jesus came, was to build a bridge so that we could cross over from death and our sin, because sin brings death, the scripture says, and we could cross over to have this new life and the Spirit of God alive in us to live out this new life. And once we profess faith in Christ and walk in this new life, being in Christ, we have this responsibility of being bridge builders. So what we're going to talk about today is just three ways to be a bridge builder. And I know we were all creative, that's so why I want you guys to get your creative juices together because we're going to go through this in this series on how to do this. And when you're out there and you're hiking up a path, you know, and you run across a place where you can't get across, you're going to try to find a, a tree that fell down to go across. You're going to try to put rocks. You're going to do everything you can to build bridges. You guys already have the resources and the creativity to be able to build bridges. And there's a lot at stake. Is why I just want to kind of take us through this series on how to do that. Because I know there's a lot of thoughts racing through your heads right now. So we're going to go in and look at some, some scripture and just how really simple this is to do. All right? And we're going to start off by looking at John the Baptist and then how John the Baptist hands it off to Jesus at the beginning of Jesus' ministry. And so to give you a little bit of background here, so we're going to jump into John 1 here, is that John the Baptist, he's on the scene. He's been preaching this message of repentance, which is calling people to change their lives, to turn away from a life living for self, living in sin, and repent just means to turn 180 degrees, turn their life to God, and start living out a new life, living your life for God. And so he's out in the wilderness preaching this message, and then Jesus comes on the scene. And when Jesus comes on the scene, Jesus says, I want you to baptize me. And John the Baptist is like, no, I need to be baptized. Jesus says, no, let this be done to fulfill all righteousness. And so here in this moment, Jesus is identifying with sinful humanity, even though he was sinless. He said, let this be done. He's modeling for those around him. So, all the, so John the Baptist has got thousands of followers, right? And Jesus, he baptizes Jesus. The Spirit of God comes on him in the form of a dove. And he hears this voice from heaven saying, this is my beloved son. All right, so this whole moment takes place. And then Jesus goes on. John's still doing his ministry. And we're going to pick up in John chapter 1, starting in verse 35. It says this, it says the next day, this is the next day after Jesus, he baptizes Jesus, the next day John was there again with two of his disciples. Now he's got a lot of disciples following him as a rabbi, as a, a teacher, a voice out in the wilderness, All right? But at this particular moment, he's got two of his disciples with him. And then it goes on in verse 36, it says, when he saw Jesus passing by, what did John do? He says, look. There's the, there's the guy. There's the one. He's the one. Look, there's the Lamb of God. He is the one that you need to follow now. And he's pointing them to Jesus. Said, Look, there is the one. There is the Lamb of God. Now, I, I think sometimes, you know, we, we kind of would fall in a tendency today because we live in kind of this selfie culture, Right? And it would be really easy, you know, if, if John the Baptist lived in this, this era, you know, just to kind of have his phone. It's like, hey, Jesus, you know, take a selfie and then post and say, look, I saw Jesus. Look, there he is, the Lamb of God. I got to, you know, look. It's all about what I'm experiencing, right? But John the Baptist is doing something there and says, look, there, there's the one. It's him. He is the Lamb of God. He's the one that you need to start following. And it goes on in verse 37. It says, when the two disciples heard him say this, they followed Jesus. 
He just did this simple thing. He says, there's the one. There's the person you need to be following. And they, his disciples, they started following Jesus. Now, what I want us to grasp is just how simple this really is. I think sometimes we just overcomplicated, overcomplicate what it means and what it looks like to share our faith with others and what it means to be a bridge builder to those that don't know Christ, that haven't come to a saving faith in the person of Jesus Christ. I think we, we make it really complicated. And, and John just did this simple thing. He said, look, there he is. There's the one. There's the one you need to be following. Now, what's crazy is John starts doing this and starts pointing his disciples that it actually stirred up an argument among his disciples. And, and it tells us this in, in the scripture here, in this next passage here in verse 25, John 3. I'm going to jump over to John 3 and we're going back to John 1. And John 3, just a very short time after John starts pointing everybody to Jesus, it says an argument developed between some of John's disciples and a certain Jew over the matter of ceremonial washing. This whole thing of, of just what is it that, what's the right way to do ceremonial washing and who should be doing it, you know, and washing their hands, baptisms was a form of ceremonial washing, and it's to believe they're just debating over this whole thing. And then it says in verse 26, they came to John and said to him, Rabbi, we got an issue here. That man, that guy that, that you were talking with the other day that came, you baptized him. Who was, he, look, he's over there on the other side of the Jordan, and look what he's doing. He's not doing it right. He's baptizing, and everybody's going to him. This is an issue. You had a ministry. You had a platform. You, you took all those selfies. You posted them online. Look, it, it, it was, you had a great thing going, and now they're, they're going to him, and he's baptizing now. You were the baptizer, not him, right? And so there's this argument. Isn't that crazy? I mean, things don't change over time, do they? We're, we're still the same. I mean, we start bickering over the craziest things. And, and John's disciples, they're like, look. And they're saying the same thing. John said, look, there's the one. They're saying, look, yeah, there's the one. And he's taking away your ministry. Now he's the one baptizing. And John, you're losing your following here. Come on, we got to do something about this. We didn't, you know, put all this work in to make this thing shrink, right? Look, you, this is not right. And I love how John responds to this whole thing. And, and I learned this verse years ago. And every time I come back to it, it's like, wow, that, it is so countercultural. And this next verse, the way John responds, I'm skipping down a couple of verses, in verse 30, John says this. It's like, guys. It's not about me. He, referring to Jesus, he must become greater. And I must become less. That's the whole reason I'm here. That's what John's saying. It's never been about me. I'm just a voice in the wilderness pointing people to Jesus. That's the whole reason I came. And I... I, I've got to become less. He's got to become greater. So when I, when I look at this verse, I think, man, that's so convicting because we live in such a self-focused world, right? And, and a self-focused culture. And so I just want to put a question up here because, and I wouldn't put a question up here if I didn't wrestle with it myself. So I just want to kind of just chew on this. When people look at your life, who would they say you are making greater? Is it you or is it Jesus? And I think it's a good thought for us to wrestle through, right? Because if I'm really honest and, and transparent, when I, when I get up in the morning and I go about my life, it's like I spend time, I have my devotion. It's like I want to make Jesus greater. But it's just crazy how all of a sudden, you know, all these emotions and all these things start interacting with people. And it just can be, just quickly become about me, Right? And don't we kind of wrestle through that sometimes? And, and John says, look, it's not about me. He must become greater. And I must become less. So when people look at your life, who do they see? Who are you making greater? Because I think what John says really should depict how the church lives out our faith. And I think that if we really embrace this and we really start to live this out, we will see the world changed for the glory of God because we're making Jesus greater, not ourselves, right? That's the whole premise. John said, I'm not here for me. My whole life has been pointing people to the one 
to the Lamb of God. So we're just going to look at just three simple ways to, to just be bridge builders today. And so the first one, number one, and we see John the Baptist doing, number one is just to use all of your influence to point people to Jesus, not yourself. Use all of your influence to point people to Jesus. Now, I know a lot of times when we start thinking about these things, that it's like, I don't have any influence, right? I don't stand up on a stage, you know? And what I want to say is you have more influence than you realize. You have a sphere of influence, connections all around you, starting in, in your home, the influence, if you've got kids, you have on your kids, Constantly, every day, pointing them to Jesus, right? Your spouse, if you're married, right? Other family members, right, that you can be an influence to, that, that even, you know, they may not be, you know, have professed faith in Christ. In the workplace, those of you that are employed at work, you know, that have go to, out and work a job every day. In the workplace, you have an incredible sphere of influence in your neighborhood. I know all those weird people live around you, right? I mean, yeah, you, you have a sphere of influence everywhere you go. How many of you have kids that are in activities, right? Dance, sports, school, right? Whole sphere of influence everywhere around you. Those that are our students they, at school, you got a whole sphere of influence around you. And I think sometimes the thing we forget is that every person that has the breath of life has an eternity, and their eternity is going to be one of two places when they breathe their last breath. I just did a funeral yesterday, and it's just a constant reminder. I, I preach the gospel every time that death is inevitable. And we're all going to be at that juncture at some point in time. And the people around us will be as well. And God has entrusted us this message of reconciliation to be a bridge builder. And he wants us to use all of our influence. One thing we learned from John about is he used all of his influence to point people to Jesus. And you've got a sphere of influence all around you. Now, I'm not saying, and I'm not going to be in this series, just be that weird Christian, you know, that's Bible thumping and acting strange. No, just being naturally supernatural, living out your life, making Jesus greater in everything you say and everything you do. And in learning, we're going to give you tips on how you can point people to Jesus and be a bridge builder. So I just want you to see how this unfolds. So the first thing that happens is John the Baptist, he goes, look, there's the one. That's the one you need to be following. It's not in me. It's in him. And then it goes on. We're going to look back at John chapter 1, starting in verse 40. It says, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, was one of the two. He's one of those two disciples that heard what John said about following Jesus. And so Andrew, it says, John said he would follow Jesus. So Andrew goes, um, and it says the first thing, verse 41, it says the first thing Andrew did, what did he do? He found his brother Simon, who is Peter, right? And told him, he said, we have found the Messiah. That is the Christ. We found the one. He's like, you know, so excited. He's like, brother, we found him. The one we've been looking for. The very first thing Andrew does is he goes and tells his brother, in verse 42, it says this, and he brought him to Jesus. All right, he became a bringer, and he brought his brother to Jesus. I heard one pastor said that found people find people. What a great word, right? Found people. Those that profess faith in Christ, found people find people. And one of the first things I did when, I, when somebody helped build a bridge, my first week at, at IU, some of you heard me tell my story. I went to IU to study jazz. I didn't go to school to be a pastor. That was later on because I do everything backwards in my life. <laughs> All right? Story of my life. And so, so, you know, I go into school to study jazz. I'm a trombone player, right? So I go there, and my first week on campus, a guy comes into my dorm room and starts sharing Jesus with me. And drew out this illustration, which we'll go through when we do this series. This bridge illustration showing me how I was separated from God. Share that verse, Isaiah 59. My sins have separated me from God. But how Christ came to build a bridge. And so that night, I prayed to receive Christ in my life. It changed my life. Grew up going to church, never, ever heard that. That I could have a personal relationship with a living God through Jesus so that night, I gave my life to Christ and got involved in a Bible study, started growing, got involved in a campus ministry called The Navigators, changed my life. 
But then when I got home on one of the weekends, you know what I did? First thing I did, I got one sibling, my brother, who's a year older than me. And I go to my brother. I'm like, John, guess what? I found Jesus. I found the one. I found Jesus. And I'm telling you, I was so good at it that in a moment, we both got our fists up like this. And we're, we're I mean, we're, I'm, you know, we're ready to just go at it, you know, because that's just how brothers do things. I don't know why. But I was about ready to say, dude, I'm going to knock you to Jesus if you don't straighten up. Now, now, my brother, you have to understand, he's like 6'3 and like 300 pounds. I mean, he could kill me if he wanted to. But we're standing there with our fists. It's like, man, I'm just trying to share my faith. <laughs> and I'm terrible at it. <laughs> but what's amazing, see, I didn't know what was going on. There was more going on in the background in his life. I didn't realize. And there was some jealousy because I got to go away to school, go to a Big Ten school. And he wanted to and he didn't. And, and so he's really frustrated. But then what's crazy, he goes to work that next week. And he was working at a grocery store, and he starts talking to some of his coworkers. Like, my brother comes home, and my brother's talking this Jesus stuff, you know, that he, he found Jesus and, and how Jesus changed his life. And he thinks, I'm going to, you know, just, just change this, just, just like that. And then this guy that he's just ranting to about me says, so what all did he tell you? You know he's right. <laughs> oh, I can't wait till he comes home again. I'm really going to knock him out, you know. So a couple months later, my brother gives his life to Christ. All because one person came and made a difference in my life. So that then I could go and bring my brother to find Jesus. And it's really that simple. And sometimes it doesn't go very well. <laughs> But the Spirit of God, God is sovereign and God is working and God did what he does best and he brought my brother to a saving faith in Christ. And so what God is asking us to do, just a simple way to build a bridge, is just use our influence, our influence and our family. When I got home at the end of that semester, I started a class at my church called God's Plan for Salvation because I had never heard it taught in that church. I wasn't the pastor. I'm just some knucklehead college student. <laughs> That gave his life to Christ. And I came home and I, I did like a six week study and I drew out the bridge and my grandparents and my parents and other people in the church came to this class. And I began to see God begin to change people's lives just using my sphere of influence. And you can do the same. Second thing, number two, is this every day make sharing Jesus your first priority. Every day. Make sharing Jesus your first priority. When you get up in the day, it's like, okay, this life is for you. It's not about me. I'm going to make you greater, and I'm going to make you less. And as I share with you, sometimes it just, just goes awry, right? You're hiking up the path, and then all of a sudden, it just becomes all about you. And, and I, it's like, I'd love to say as a pastor, it's my first priority every day is just to share Jesus with people. But it's time, it's like, I just get focused on myself. I don't want to, but I do. But when I'm here on Sunday, it's, it's my number one priority is to point people to Jesus. And our kids' ministry, our volunteers that are, that are working back there, it's our number one priority. On Sunday night with our students, it's our number one priority is to point people to Jesus, right? To do everything we can to make it our top priority. And I pray that God help this to be my top priority. So when I see people, I see them the way you see them. And I don't get all bent out of shape and start grumbling and complaining about this neighbor or that person. And you know, you know what I'm saying? It's just easy to do. And forget that my role as a Christ follower is to build bridges, not to tear them down. Right? But it's so easy to reverse that. And so I need to make it the, the first priority in my life to point people to Jesus. And so... I'm just going to kind of put our mission statement up here on the screen. This is really the whole essence of the Christian life. It's just breaking down just these greatest commands in Scripture. And the first one that we have in our mission statement, we used to have a sign up. We're remodeling, so it's not up right now. And we're re revamping all that. So it's to love God. That's our first priority is to love God. Be right. Christ came to build a bridge so we could be right with God. Our first priority is to love God with our whole heart, soul, mind, and strength. And the second thing, the second command Jesus said, is quoting Deuteronomy from the Old Testament, from the, from the Mosaic Law, is to love people. Love your neighbor as yourself. Loving people. Believers and unbelievers. 
And then we take what God has done in our lives. It's not, the church was never meant to be a country club for Christians. And somehow over time, we, we kind of adopt and buy into this mindset that it's all about us. The church is a training ground for those that have professed faith in Christ and those that are, that are seeking after Christ. So they can come and, 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 to faith in Christ. And we all are, are working on being transformed into the image of Jesus, right? And so we're to love God and to love people and we're to take everything that God has given us and to go and to take it and to go change the world with that good news of what God has done for us. And it needs to be the top first priority in our lives. It is our number one job responsibility. That's what Jesus called his church to do is to go. The last thing Jesus told his disciples before he ascended into heaven after his resurrection was to go and proclaim the good news of Christ to the ends of the earth. Now, I know a lot of times as as Christ followers, it's like, I don't don't think we wake up and say, I don't want to share Jesus. I don't think that's ever on our mindset. I know it's never on my mindset. But there's so many times we're reluctant And we kind of, as I talked about last week about Saul, we hide behind the baggage that we have in our lives, right? Because we think, well, I just just don't have all the answers. I'm I'm just not smart enough. I just don't know enough about the Bible, right? How many of you ever think thoughts like that? Somebody's going to ask me, I mean, we've all been here. Somebody's going to ask me something, and I'm not going to know the answer to it. Well, here's what I want to tell you. Let's put this next bullet point up here. Jesus calls us to be his witness, not his attorney. Right? 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 We're not his attorney. We don't have to have all the answers. What a witness does when they're called on the stand is they just share their story of how their life was impacted. And your number one job is just to share how Jesus changed your life. And we see it over and over again in the scriptures. One guy said, look, I was blind and now I see. Right? This is what Jesus did. He changed my life. And there's a number of stories represented in this room. Right? Every one of us have a story of how Christ changed our life. And Jesus called us to be his witness, not his attorney. Matter of fact, in Acts 1.8, this next verse here, this is after Jesus, is right, right before Jesus ascends to heaven, he tells his disciples, he says, he says go and wait in the city. He says, you're going to receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. So you're going to have the power, the impetus, the work of the Holy Spirit in you and on you to do the work that he's called you to do. You are not alone. God's given you the power to do it. And he said, the Holy Spirit's going to come on you and you will be my witnesses. He didn't say attorneys that you will be my witnesses. Go and share your story, how Jesus transformed your life. Give it away so others can see. What did Jesus do? How did he change your life? One moment. I was just lost trying to figure out who I was. Lost in trying to figure out my identity when I was, you know, a freshman down at IU. I didn't know. I was, I was just carrying around a piece of brass, my horn. That was my identity. I guess I'm just supposed to be a professional trombone player because I didn't know what else to do. And I'm telling you, at that stage in life, it's hard trying to figure out, what do I do? I, at some point here, i got to grow up and get a real job, Right? Either go to school, get some kind of education. And even then, a lot of people that get degrees today don't even work in their field. Right? I'm proof of that. <laughs> I did for a little bit. I did for 10 years, right, as an audio engineer. But, but it's, it's like, what is God calling us to? That job never changes, to go and tell the world. All right? So I want to go back to just how simple this is. Back to John chapter 1, verse 42. Just Andrew makes it so simple. It says, it says that he brought him to Jesus. And it's really that simple. And what I want to encourage you just to make it this simple is that the reason he brought him to Jesus is because he knew if he got him in the presence of Jesus, it would change his life. And it not only changed his life, but on the day of Pentecost, when the Holy Spirit came upon the church, this, this guy, Peter, who denied Jesus three times, who was this, became this kind of coward, was hiding because he blew it. And then Jesus, the end of John 21, he affirms him. On the day of Pentecost, Peter stands up and he becomes a great leader in the church. And it says a thousand people come to faith in Christ that day. Right? All because Andrew built a bridge, pointed him, brought him to Jesus, brought him to a place 
where he could experience Jesus. And all you got to do is bring someone with you. Be a bringer. Bring an includer. Bring them to church with you. Say, just just come. Just just be a bringer. Now, I know sometimes you're like, you know, but you don't know my friends. You know, these people that I talk to, they are so skeptical, right? And when you look at at the world today, there's so much skepticism about the church. Yeah, it's like, it's like, I know what the church is like. Oh, yeah, I've heard about that church, Life Change Church. They're the ones that worship Halloween, (laughs) right? I mean, they give away big candy, full-size candy bars and hot dogs and hot apple cider. No, we don't worship Halloween. That's not true. But yeah, we, we give away stuff to build bridges because we know people are going around from door to door. And they didn't hesitate eating that hot dog. Right. Skeptical as they might be, right? Yep. But we got people here in this room that lives was changed because of a Kit Kat. Yep. Right? Right? Small little things can make a huge difference. And there's always going to be skeptics. And they say, well, you know, I've been to that church once. And then your pastor didn't even read the Bible. He uses an iPad. Well, that's true. It's because he's old and he can't read the large print Bible that was given to him several years ago. So I have to make it extra big and backlit so I can read it. Otherwise, I'm constantly putting glasses on and taking them off. That's what happens when you get past 50. And they make the pages so thin on the giant print Bibles that you can't even read through them. It just bleeds through. So I had to transition to my iPad. All right. So here's what I want you to see when it comes to skeptics. Because we're all going to run into skeptics. There's always going to be skeptics. All right. And here's what takes place. As this story continues to unfold in John chapter 1. It says, the next day, Jesus decided to leave for Galilee. And he went and found somebody. He finds this guy, Philip. And this was a common thing for rabbis to do. They would, all, they would always have these, these rabbis, Jewish rabbis, they would have followers, and they would just go and make an invitation and say, come and follow me. I'm going to teach you how to do this. I'm going to teach you how to live for God. And so he goes and he finds this guy, Philip. He says, just come and follow me. And so Philip starts following Jesus. And then we get to verse 45. It says, so Philip, what does Philip do? Found people, find people. Philip, he's probably thinking, hey, I've got a buddy that doesn't know, know Jesus. So Philip found Nathaniel. He goes to find somebody. He found Nathaniel and told him, we have found the one Moses wrote about in the law and about all, the, you know, all whom the prophets also wrote about, Jesus, the, the Savior, Jesus, the son of Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. I mean, he's so excited. You know, he kind of catches it there with that exclamation point. It's like, we found the one. We found him, the Savior of the world. All right? And this is kind of what I was when I was talking to my brother. And then we get to the next verse. I mean, Philip's so excited to share with Nathaniel. Nazareth? I, I hear this voice, Jim Moore, like, playoffs? Yeah, right. <laughs> Nazareth? Nazareth? Really? Nazareth? Can, can anything good come from Nazareth? I mean, that, that's just a dump. It's a stone quarry. This is a little dumpy town. It's a stone quarry. And that's why a lot of scholars think that, that Joseph, Jesus' you know, dad, was a stonemason or some kind of a civil engineer because it was a place where there was a quarry. It's like Nazareth? Can, can anything come good come out of Nazareth? Really? Are you, are you kidding me? I mean, he's skeptical. It's like, that's ridiculous. Sorry, but you can keep following that guy, but nobody good can come from Nazareth. So what does he do? What do you do when... when you run into a skeptic. Well, this is, what, this is what Philip does. Next verse. He says, Nathaniel, just, just come. Just one time. I'll, I'll even pick you up. I'll, I'll bring you on my donkey. Just, just come. <laughs> There's a <the> back seat. <laughs> I know it's raining, but it's all right. I'll carry an umbrella. Right? Just, just come and see, said Philip. Just, just come and check it out. And it's just let, let Jesus be Jesus, right? You don't have to have all the answers. Just come, just be bring, bring a bringer. Just bring them with you. Come and see. There's always going to be skeptics. And so this is what takes place. Verse 47, it says, When Jesus saw Nathanael approaching, he said of him, Now here truly is an Israelite in whom there is no deceit. And then we get verse 48. Here's the skeptic. How do you know me? I mean, you're saying something about me. It's like, how do, how do you even know me? Nathaniel asked. Jesus answered, 
Look, I saw you while you were still under the fig tree before Philip called you. Now, now here's what we don't typically understand. I didn't even know this until I was reading this and studying this this week. That, That phrase, under the fig tree, was a common thing that rabbis would say. And what he's saying is like, Nathaniel, I saw you meditating on the word of God. It was a common thing to sit under a fig tree. And rabbis would often say this. What were you doing today? I was sitting under a fig tree. I mean, I was praying and meditating on the word of God. And Jesus said, I saw you. I saw you right before Philip came and invited you to come and see. You were there meditating on the word of God and praying. And and I hear stuff like this all the time. People will say, you know, you bring somebody to church and they're like, man, they come up to me after service and say, did, did, did you know what I was going through this week? Right? No, I didn't know what you were going through because everything you were talking about was exactly what I was going through this week. That's not me. That's the work of the Holy Spirit, right? Because God's word goes forth and accomplishes its purposes, right? And so, so here Jesus reveals this stuff about him because he's the son of God. He goes, how do you know me? It's like, I saw you where you're still under the fig tree. Here's this skeptic. Notice what it says here in verse 49. It says, Nathaniel declared, Rabbi, you are the son of God. You are the king of Israel. How does that happen? That's the work that God does. All we got to do is be his witness, right? All we got to do is just be one to bring and invite. And, and, and Philip says, just, just come, just come and see and experience Jesus. And it's just a simple thing you can do. It's just invite people to come. Matter of fact, I've put together a bunch of invite cards in six packs. All right? And I want to encourage you on your way out today to take six packs. Take one or two with you and use them to invite others, to be a bringer and includer, to bring people with you. Because there's people all around you in your sphere of influence that are facing a crisis eternity. And God has given you the number one priority to share your faith and to be a bringer and invite people to come. And just the last thing, number three, is this. Just keep it simple. It's as simple as come and see. And let and trust God to do the rest. Because God is already working in those people's hearts. Amen.